All right, and we're live. Thank you, everybody, for joining us on today's uh, .NET Desktop Community Stand-Up. I'm your host, Dimitri Lylan, and I have with me a guest today, Jeremy Kuhn. Jeremy, welcome to the stand-up. Hi. <laughs> so we're going to kick it off in a minute with Jeremy. He's going to be doing a lot of great demos and talking to us about WinForms. Uh, but just to kind of recap what we're going to be talking about as an overall topic today, we're going to start with the WinForms conversation. Jeremy is going to uh, go as long as he needs to. He has such a good topic. We really want to get through all of it. And then we're going to switch over towards the end and talk a little bit about what's been happening in the world of XAML, similar to what we did last week, but just to recap to anybody who's missed it and give an update on the WebView 2 control. But with that, I really want to get to Jeremy's topic. So again, Jeremy, thank you for being here. Maybe you can tell folks a little bit about who you are. All right. Um, I've been at Microsoft since uh, 1997, so a while. I spent six years on Office. And then uh, the next 11 years, I spent on Expression and Blend. So uh, that should be familiar to some of you. And um, Very. And from there, yeah. Then from there, I uh, spent the last well, the next five years on on uh, .NET Core, basically. And so I've, I've shipped all the versions of .NET Core, and um, I own System IO was the primary thing that I did. And uh, last year, I started helping out a bit with uh, WinForms, and in uh, the early part of this year, I joined the WinForms team. So awesome. now, I'm, now I'm on the WinForms team. So great. Well, uh, it's exciting to have you on the WinForms team because uh, you know it even surprised me a little bit that we're doing some really great stuff uh, with WinForms on .NET Core five. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about what the project's you know all about. Sure. You know, there's you know in .NET Core as a whole, I'm, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the performance has gotten significantly better. Um, so for the .NET Core runtime, the libraries, you know, and, and if you weren't aware of why, the basic gist is that you know we, we were able to shed some of the legacy stuff, uh, like notably app domains and, and, and code access security. And that, that made for a, a, a sort of a slimmer foundation that we were able to build on. But the bigger thing is we were able to like iterate faster because we weren't using a shared code base amongst multiple versions of the framework, which you know made it very uh, difficult to make changes on uh, on the uh, existing or the old .NET framework. Um, and the other part of it is, is you know, there has been a, an, an increased focus on what was called peanut butter internally, and they even have that in the blog posts, is, is it saying that like, well, you know, little changes in or changes in very specific areas may not add up on their own, but when you do that as kind of a general thing, you you aggregate to some pretty significant performance improvements that are visible just broadly, right? And um, that's part of how things have really made a big difference on uh, .NET Core itself. You know, in WinForms, we're starting to take that same sort of approach to go through and clean that peanut butter out, and that's kind of what I'm going to talk right. a little bit about. One of those things where I, I did this time for uh, .NET five. Um, and a big part of that peanut butter, incidentally, is just trying to get a handle on allocation, right? So a big portion of where your performance impacts come from is, you know, putting undue work or unnecessary work on the garbage collector. Um, the more the garbage collector right. has to do, the slower your apps get. So um, that's kind of the one of the, the the biggest top line things for peanut butter to come out. And you know, we. Uh, Take care of that a bit, you know, in, in uh, Core three one. But uh, the primary focus has been, and even still now, is getting the designer up and making sure that WinForms is there at all. Right, and, uh, it's, it's know, a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, it's significant work, and that's what most of the work effort still is on. You know, getting the designer polished up and 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 ready for uh, like you know prime time usage. And uh, but. Despite that, you know, we have been doing effort or making an effort on, on this, uh, you know, performance and other features have been coming in, like accessibility stuff has been in progress. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the one of the big parts that we did starting in 3.1 and then now we're, we did it more significantly is we improved the interop or the, the interfacing with Windows itself. So we're being much more efficient about how we talk to the native uh, Windows APIs, which actually makes a big difference, you know, kind of across the board. Mm. Um, the thing that I'm going to talk about now is that, like, I working on some of the plumbing in, in WinForms or in the runtime for WinForms, 
And specifically, the thing I'm going to show today is the stuff I did around drawing. So when your window has to redraw, um, there was some peanut butter <laughs> there. And, you know, I, I uh, basically cleaned that up and re-architected that to, to uh, get better performance on the redraw, at least for, you know, the drawing aspect of that. And I, I have a demo that I can show you, and uh, we'll go into that. Um, it was partially also driven by the uh, the need to get a better handle on our on our um, management of native resources. So it was kind of a two pronged thing: is to make it easier to understand when we were actually holding on resources and letting them go, and then also you know being much more efficient about that. Right. So. Yeah, it's really exciting. I mean, I used to be a WinForms developer before I even joined Microsoft. I, I shipped one app to production at a bank, and it was just a, such a great product even back then. To, but it certainly has, you know, has had a lot of age on it. Like we've we've been working on WinForms for a while. We've been working on .NET, and .NET Core has been a really exciting journey. So I'm I'm really curious to see what kind of optimizations we're able to do uh, as part of this. And uh, yeah, let's jump into a demo if you're ready. I'll I'll get your screen up and sure, I'll take a look. All right. Sounds good. So I'm adding your screen to the stream, and uh, you should be good to go. All right. So, you know, what I have here, I'm going to zoom in for a bit, you know, is I have, I've got a project uh, with three WinForms apps. They all have the exact same code. As a matter of fact, you can see the arrows. It's just linked into the other projects. Mm -hmm. And there is a one targeting .NET Core 3.1. Uh, then there's .NET 5, and then .NET Framework 4.8. And uh, that's what we're going to be looking at here and uh, go back out of the, the zoom here and what I am doing here is you know I'm going to start up a main form and you know uh, I'm firing off other forms with controls on them and then forcing a redraw by directly calling into windows here there's, there's a redraw window here and a you know an update window and I'm doing that multiple times so I can get an average of the allocations that are being done by calling GC get allocated bytes per current thread. Mm -hmm. And, doing and, and so some, if somebody doesn't fully understand like what get allocations does, like can you describe that a little bit? So it, this this looks at how many bytes the gar, the the dot net runtime has actually allocated for the current thread, and then when you you know do it again, you just take the difference, and then you can see what was done specifically for the work that you're doing on whatever the current thread happens to be. So right. we know that this is all stuff that we directly impacted on this thread. Right, and if um, the average goes down, that's that's better. Versus it's significantly better because yeah. you know the, when when we're when we're cutting the amount of allocations that we're doing, you know, and redrawing can happen a lot, of course, with your forms when you're resizing them, moving around, or doing whatever. Um, you're you're make, putting less pressure on the garbage collector, and if you've ever run your app and then seen the the diagnostics pane over where it's tracking the memory. Mm -hmm. um, you'll see little yellow triangles wherever the garbage collector runs. And when things are going really slow, typically you're going to see a whole bunch of little yellow triangles. <laughs> it's because you're allocating a ton, you're making the garbage collector do a, a lot of work. Right. So cutting those down, cutting allocations down, will spread those triangles out a little bit. And the, and the more we do this sort of thing, the further those triangles go, and and uh, the faster everything uh, will feel and, and become. Mm -hmm. So okay, awesome. um, the... I'm going to start up the uh, this one, and I'll show you the different ones here. So uh, I've got the right focus. There we go. So I've got this is the .NET 5 one. Oh, I actually did start it twice, didn't I? I didn't see it at first. <laughs> Go away. Just one. All right. And above it is the .NET 3.1, Core 3.1. And over here is framework 4.8. Now I'm running at 150% scaling. Um, and you know, this is kind of intentional. And to show you this, I'm actually designing for high DPI here. Um, it's one of the things we've done a little bit better on in, in uh, .NET Core. Um, and you can see the 4.8, even though it's the exact same code, has it just doesn't scale quite the same way. In, or right. So, so, so the, the left window you're sp talking about specifically. There, yeah, right? this, this one right here is yeah. the 4.8. Mm -hmm. So that's this one here, and then this one over here is 3.1, and this is .NET 5. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to kick open form here by clicking on this button with a data grid view, and that's really pretty much our heaviest weight control that we have, or one of the heaviest weight ones. So it, it's, it does a lot of work, and a lot of it isn't drawing, um, but I'm going to kick that up. It's filled with a data source, which is just basically looking at everything that's on control. 
I did that 50 times and it's allocated 222 kilobytes for each redraw. So, you know, that's, that's pretty significant. Um, yep. In 3.1, we'll kick that off here too. And here we are down from 222 kilobytes to 205. So, so a small improvement. It's it improve, all improvements are good, so that that's good. But um, in in five, we'll kick this off again and you know run through the same fifty iterations because this is the exact same phone running each one. Now we're down to seventy two point seven. That's so yeah, significant. That, that's pretty significant, particularly for this one because there's not a lot of uh, drawing in it outside of, I mean, there's a ton of extra work about keeping the cell data organized and make sure it's up to date and all that sort of thing. So it's pretty significant. Um, the next one I'm going to show is many controls here. And that's this, that's just basically taking all the basic controls off of the, the toolbox and dropping them on a form. Um, and uh, just seeing what we get out of that. So there are button checkboxes, list views, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Great. And you know that we did this one 400 times because it doesn't do nearly the same amount of work that data grid view does. Right. And that, it was 100 kilobytes on uh, the framework 4.8. And on core 3.1, we'll see the same 400 redraws happening. And when we see the result for that, it's down to 78. Again, you know, you can see the same sort of incremental improvement just by running on core period. Um, and then uh, many controls on uh, .NET 5 is slightly better. And we're down to 4.3 yeah. kilobytes from Yeah, look at that. That's huge. <laughs> so pretty significant. Um, the next one is a similar sort of thing with a bunch of controls. This one's out of one of the things in our, in our actual uh, solution for, the, for wind forms. We used to test. It's not as complicated. But you know, similar, you know, variety of uh, controls, and it's seventy-five kilobytes. So on uh, four point eight, so less stuff going on. So that's why it's uh, you know, down from hundred there. And um, I'll look at that again on three one. That's down to fifty-five from seventy-five. So good. And five. We're down to six point four from the original seventy five. Wow! So, yeah, pretty big jump. And you know, some of some of this stuff, work that's happening during redraw is not actually drawing. There's actually checking the date, state of the data and all that sort of thing. So the next one I'm going to show you is the group box, and uh, it's just because there's really no significant logic to a group box, right? As far as when it redraws, it's just a bunch of uh, lines to give you the sort of 3D effect of the lines and uh, the text, right? So right. we can see what that looks like. And uh, because there's not significant stuff going on here, I'm doing this actually 10,000 times. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, it doesn't take long. and you'll see that we're, you know, even though this is just drawing a few lines, you're still taking eight and a half kilobytes for, for each redraw. Um, and we'll look at uh, core three one. And we'll see a similar sort of thing. Well, we get a small improvement. Yeah. So meaningful 6.5. And then on uh, five, We're down to 0.3 kilobytes. Wow. From yeah. Five. Yeah. So, so like when you, when customers think about these improvements, how how will their applications like get the benefit? Or they if they just upgrade to .NET Core five when it ships G eight? Does this just appear for them as part of the? Yeah. These 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 will appear will just appear for your drawing things. You know this there. Uh, you may do additional work when you're redrawing, and you may have other controls, and the things vary from control to control. Um, that's why I did the sort of general one with a whole bunch on there and so it showed the really heavyweight one. Um, but, you know, the actual allocations during redraw are going to be uh, significantly less. Um, and, you know, the next thing I've got here is, uh, you know, I did make a few API changes um, that you can take advantage of and that will help some of your scenarios if you actually utilize the new APIs. Um, and that's mm -hmm. drawing some text on form. Um, the two things that we did or is that we added a uh, 
iDevice context to pain event args. Uh, pain event args, what you get when you're doing a read a ROM that um, has a graphics object associated with it. Um, and graphics, you know, system drawing dot graphics, you know, implements iDevice context. And if you wanted to draw text, you would use text render and WinForms, and you could pass it the iDevice context that you get out of that, which is pass it the graphics object, basically. And you can draw into that. Um, the thing is with that, you know, like when we're getting stuff from Windows, we don't get a gra uh, system drawing graphics object. Um, we get just a handle. And the iDevice context is to get the handle <laughs> that we were given. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of cases we don't need to deal with the graphics object. And when you're taking the iDevice context directly from the pain event args, if we haven't need, if we didn't need to actually go and create the graphics object, we can avoid creating the graphics object and uh, save quite a bit of memory there just to wrap the the device context thing into a the GDI plus thing, which is the graphics object, and then take it back out again to do the drawing. So um, you now have the ability to pass your your pain event args directly into anything that takes an eye device context. And in the cases where we can take advantage of the optimizations, we will. Right. So the next part of that is we actually added uh, span overloads to, to text renderer. So you could pass your text in as a span rather than having to allocate a string when you don't need to. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to 10,000 times. I'm going to like update the text, and you'll see it count because it's going up 10,000 times. And you know it's just drawing a very simple string. And you know on uh, the .NET Framework 4.8, you know, we have 3.2 kilobytes to draw one string. And, you know, it's re also repainting the background. So it's a fill and then uh, drawing text. Right, all of those. And on 3.1, you know, there is a small improvement. It's down to 2.8. And on .NET 5, I, am, I would get a similar sort of improvement uh, on things, but or a, a bigger improvement, but like I'm also going to be doing the, the span stuff here, and I'll show you what that code looks like when we're done here. But um, you know, do the same ten thousand things, and you should probably should, should see that that's sort of perceivably faster. But it's doing you know 0.25 kilobytes. Yeah, you you could definitely see that that one was an easy one. So um, for for. Custom drawing in particular, if you're particularly if you're doing uh, text, the, you can take advantage of the text stuff in your in your forms, and uh, you'll see a significant impact on your performance stuff if you're taking advantage of the native APIs. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's not terribly sophisticated. It's just you know in the case here, it's I got this text on a form thing, and I'm just using a string builder in both cases to like build up my string. I'm adding the paint count into it and doing a format on it. And uh, the string builder is actually pretty efficient at this. I actually worked some on string builder, so I know we, we did some improvements on string builder too, <laughs> and also in .NET Core. Um, but here I said, like, well, if, the, if I'm in the project that has the .NET five stuff, I'm going to take a span here on the here doing it just on the stack because it's not a particularly long string that I'm doing. Um, or I could take this from a ray pool or something like that, some, te some temporary scratch buffer, or just keep one static on the, on the class. Copying the stuff out of the string builder and you know, getting the size again. We're both call so I'm calling size on and then telling it pre precisely where to draw it. And uh, then calling text render or draw text. Instead of passing in the e.graphics, which you did before, I can just throw any. And that would be would be the paint of an args up here. Right, and that's that, great. A huge difference on on allocations. Yeah, yeah, that's huge. So yeah, these these are great. So basically, like a lot of these improvements are going to come from just uh, just switching over to um, to working with .NET Core five for your application for making that the runtime. And then if you're really heavy on strings, people should take a look at this different and, way of doing it. You know, part of this is you know the reason I'm doing this is to also illustrate that you know we're you know, we're on a journey. This isn't like done, <laughs> and so like we have plenty more to do. But like we're we're definitely like moving forward, and and you know we're getting lots of uh, contributions from the community. Um, a big part of the interop stuff was done by very active community members. Um, you know, and uh, you know that's between them and ourselves, and you know just a lot of passionate people. We're actually getting some significant work done. And uh, we'll continue to do so. Um, 
and I actually put this project up on on uh, GitHub, and that's under you know my name, Jeremy Cooney, and Reader on Performance is awesome. what that project is, and uh, you can actually just run this yourself. You do, however, need to install the most current version of .NET 5 RC1 to do that, and you need the, the preview of 16.8, uh, and I've got the links down there if you want to want to mess with that yourself. Uh, you know, .NET 5 currently those the uh, the newer builds require a very uh, current version of of, .NET, of the Visual Studio. All right, awesome. Yeah, we'll we'll get all those links from you, and we'll make sure they're in the show notes. If if folks uh, folks don't know where to go, we'll make sure that's easy to find. Cool. Um, is there anything else in the journey that you you're thinking about now? Like, what's what's the next step? You talked about it being a journey. What are you thinking? So there's there's plenty of other architectural things. You know, the, the you know, for me personally, I'm sort of passionate about scaling working right <laughs> because yeah, you know, I do run high DPI stuff and a little bit of trivia. I actually worked on high DPI for office back 20 years ago. Wow. So, you know, I worked on some of the original high DPI things, just trying to get office so that it would work period on them. You know, the, the monitor that we got back then, which was actually more than a 4k, just barely was actually a twenty-four thousand dollar monitor at the time. <laughs> so uh, yeah. you know, a lot has progressed since then. But you know, I've, I've been very passionate about uh, things looking nice and sharp. You know, for me, it was like moving from dot matrix to laser printers. You know, is to get the same similar effect. So uh, I'm I'm taking quite a I'm taking a look at the you know our layout engine in particular uh, with this in mind. You know, I so that that's that's on the Ultimately, I want to do that and work to improve that. How much I get done just depends on time and other things that are happening. But you know, it's a longer term goal of mine is to get that get that uh, cleaned up. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and as people are filing issues or anything in GitHub, I'm assuming the team is looking at that and we oh, yeah. can be influenced if folks point out some some optimization that we can work on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, like you know, if you know, there's like with anything, we're limited somewhat by the existing API surface, right? You know, we still have to make the existing APIs work the way they always did. Um, so, you know, you some of, some of the inefficiencies or the slowness come around the model because um, we have to notify, you know, you, you know, for things that are on the on, you know, on paint and what all the other things. And, you know, the way that that was set up when it was originally started, you know, and WinForms was the coding for WinForms actually started in the mid 90s or what became WinForms. Uh, you know, there was a vastly different environment back then, and .NET 1 certainly didn't have nearly the amount of functionality <laughs> for the later one. So, you know, the designs were based on things when you didn't have generics and all this sort of stuff. So, um, and also running on Windows 95, right? <laughs> so, you know, yeah. there, there's significant uh, allocation uh, in the design to uh, to make that happen. But, you know, that said, you know, there, you know, while we can't, like, fix everything. There's actually quite a bit of opportunity to fix things uh, across the board that have significant impact. So, you know, you know, getting feedback from things that you see that are particularly slow is also useful, right? To see that like, well, do this thing and it seems really, it's allocating a ton or I see this sort of stuff, um, you know, that can help clue us into things because, you know, WinForms is a, is a huge code base and it's, you know, while I can see things when I'm walking, looking through the code, I go, oh, wait a minute, I could do that better. Um, you know, there's the aggregate of stuff in these real world user scenarios to, to help illustrate where prioritization should happen. So, uh, you know, I'll continue to scrape the peanut butter off as I go through and see things. It, it helps to know where that peer, which peanut butter aggregates more in your actual scenarios. So um, that's that's useful information to give to even if you don't know technically what's going on, you can say like, well, I've got this small thing I did, and you know, it seems like WinFarms is allocating a ton for that, and you know, that's all very interesting stuff for us, and for even the community members that are actually you know contributing to the code base as well, because mm -hmm. it, it is fun and rewarding for some people to <laughs> actually quite a few people to like actually take something and make it better. So that's why we're getting quite a bit of uh, active con contributions from the community as well. And that's why I'm on WinForms too, because 
I'm sort of driven by that sort of thing. You know, I see something that I can make better. I really want to do that. And that's, that's how I ended up doing system IO. That's how I ended up on Windows forums is because, you know, I've been a user for a long, long time. And, you know, I was anxious to fix the things that I saw <laughs> and, it, and I find that rewarding and that makes me, uh, makes me a happier developer. Right? <laughs> so. Yeah, for sure. Um, what, one of the things we talked about um, from like the practical standpoint, right? Like if folks uh, get the latest um, .NET 5 uh, and they, they, try, they test their existing WinForms application, um, these improvements might or might not be obvious, right? Like they're, we're changing the foundation of the system. We're making sure we're optimized yep. in the memory pressure, garbage collection, garbage collection and such. So therefore folks should um, see that as positive indicators if they see those indicators trending down, then that means the changes are doing what they're, what they're supposed to. And I guess we're, we're just looking for feedback. If folks see something running faster, running slower, please let us know if the app begin, you know, begins to work strangely. Like this is the time to let us know. Like we're doing our best to test it, but uh, there's so yeah. many possibilities. In, in here. Yeah, well, we're doing you know quite a bit of like, there, there's like plenty more work to do. And like, but you know, we've done a significant amount of effort too. And if you look at the evolution of the core runtime, you can look at like Stephen Tobe's uh, uh, performance posts over the years. <laughs> very, it, very epic posts. Yeah, they're pretty epic. And like, you know, that's, it, it's a pro, it's a process, you know, in three, in, in 1.0, when we did it, there was, yeah, we made some improvements, but you know, there's a lot of a lot of busy work. I mean, I went through all those releases. So there's a lot of busy work in one and one one and two one zero just to get the functionality in. But we were still making performance improvements. And you know, WinForms is still in that same sort of bucket as like early .NET Core. You know, where we're we're doing our best to get everything up online, make sure everything works, and yet still you know deliver some features. You know, and and uh, and improvements. And you know, if stuff is uh, as we move forward and the other stuff slows down, you will be able to focus more time on the improvements and, and speed and with feedback that helps drive it too. you know, if these things are, are meaningful and, and interesting to you and you're voicing that, that helps, uh, helps everybody here, you know, know how to prioritize to make sure that everybody's as happy as we can make them, you know? Yeah. Awesome. Well, this is great. Uh, I really look forward to see what the community has to say about it. Um, so we we have uh, some statements in the chat. People seem excited. You know, they have uh, WinForms applications with like hundreds of controls, and they're they're hoping these uh, these improvements make a difference. So, folks like Daniel, definitely give it a shot. Let us know what you're seeing. Um, take a look at some of the performance traces that the Agnostic Hub is giving you, and see if you can feel anything in the application. That sort of thing is always very interesting to to correlate there. Um, does anybody in the chat have any other questions? Um, okay, we have one question. Has data grid, data grid view been ported to .NET Core? I don't know if that's a thing. What, data grid view? Uh, data grid view, yeah. That's yeah. what you're showing us. So that's so what it shows, data grid it's view. It's there, okay. Yeah. Okay, so data grid view should be there. Um, it, was it there in 3.1 or was, was it there only in 5? Uh, we dropped one. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me make sure I'm not being insane here. So like the, the yeah, it's it's it should be data grid view. Um, yeah, it's data grid view. You can see it there. Okay. So I mean that, that's the one that's there. We dropped the other one, uh, data grid, I believe. The, the, I see. There was an older data grid, and, and data grid view was the newer one. Um, So right. That, uh, cool. Well, I'm yeah. sure it was there in three one too, but I, I I I wasn't on the team, so I'm I might be uh, wrong. Okay, sounds good. All right. Well, uh, it, since there's no other questions to the community, I just want to thank you for your time. Um, sure. We hope to see you back on when you have more to say, and uh, we'll keep an eye on what's happening for WinForms. Yep. This is awesome. All right, Jeremy. Thank you so much for being on. Great. See you next time. All right, so uh, that was Jeremy. Thank you again for him for joining us. So we're gonna switch gears a little bit right now. Um, and uh, and just FYI for folks in the chat, if, if you do have more questions you come up with for Jeremy, if you put them in the chat, you know, he is up on Twitter, so we can try to get him to answer them there. So just feel free to, to keep those coming. But uh, yeah, he's, he's off the call right now. 
So we're gonna share, I'm gonna share my screen, so give me one second here. Share my screen, hopefully you folks can see that. All right, there it is. So let's talk a little bit about WPF and UWPs, Ammon Forms, et cetera, the XAML side of the, of the house. So if anybody in the live stream doesn't know, I'm actually the program manager that works in XAML tooling. So uh, Jeremy's from the WinForms team. They're, they're like a you know team really close to us here in, in the XAML tooling space, but XAML is where I spend my time. And I'm really excited about uh, you know Visual Studio Update 7. Update 7 has gone GA recently, so this happened um, after the last uh, community live stream that we did. So if you if you watched the last one, we talked about some of the things that were coming as GA, now GA is here. And uh, I just wanted to point out all the features that we shipped as part of that GA. In other words, features that as far as we know, should work 100% and we hope you're using them, testing them and giving us feedback. So those features in 16.7 include uh, some refinement work. Um, so we've been refining the in-app toolbar experience in Visual Studio, so if you run your application, you get that little bar inside inside of the app that has the buttons in it. And we've tried to make that uh, just be, be smaller and really out of your way, try to keep it in the toolbar itself. So that's the kind of work that's been ongoing for multiple releases, and we've done some more work here in this release. And then we, we launched a major new feature. Uh, so I'm really excited to talk about design time data support. We've had design time data support with the XAML designer for quite a bit of time, but it was a more complicated way of doing it. You had to create a fake view model, uh, basically mo a mock view model, mock the data in there. And then you had to you know, set, set the data context to that view model. You had to maintain the view model relative to your real view model that your runtime app gets. So definitely doable, something I've done for, for desktop applications, but it wasn't super easy. And especially when you're just getting started, and you're building a view where you don't even have a view model in mind yet 100%. You're just kind of laying controls out. You want to start seeing things. So we're trying to make that scenario be, be much better and give people choice in how to implement that. And that's design time data. And I'm going to go ahead and demo that in a minute, but let me just go through a few more things here. So another change that came in based on customer feedback was that people wanted the refresh button in the designer. There were certain situations where um, state things in a really complicated solution just went out of whack and the designer, if you would close reopen, would actually fix it for you. And we acknowledge like, you know, XAML is really hard language to, to visualize. Sometimes things do go wrong. So adding that refresh button helps. And in fact, there's certain design time data scenarios where the refresh button does the trick where you're changing design time data. And, and um, for just sort of like historic architectural reasons, some things won't won't update in the in the designer view. But if you were to close it or hit the refresh button, it would do the trick. So that button is available for both uh, WPF.NET Core developers and UWP developers. Unfortunately, um, we weren't able to kind of in a cheap way bring it back to .NET framework, but keep the feedback coming if you really think it's needed. Uh, we'll certainly listen to you if we can. And then we did uh, a feature that's been a really long-standing customer request. And the customer request was, to add a color visualizer to, to the XAML code editor. And uh, this was possible through third-party extensions, community projects and such, but we finally built it in. So now this should be available for everybody, WPF Core, Framework, and XAML Forms. Um, there is uh, some basically like architectural challenge with DWP right now. So that's the one framework that didn't get this feature. Um, but again, like keep, keep us honest, keep the feedback coming. We are trying, it's, you know, we, we really wanted it there, but we we're causing performance problems. And we definitely don't want to do that uh, just by adding a color visualizer. So we had to pull that back. But core framework, WPF, and then Xamarin Forms were able to get it. Um, we also, just to acknowledge some re more, more recent community feedback, folks have told us that uh, a few people have said, like, we don't like the color visualizer. Like, it's great that you added this. For the people that want it, we don't want it please give us a way to remove it. So we are considering adding a setting in the future to, to make this a switch that you can try on and off. Um, so that's, that's the update there. All right, so let's switch real quick. I'm going to open Visual Studio and show design time data in action. So in Visual Studio here, I'll go full screen. Um, you, uh, you can look at my sample application. So this is up on GitHub. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. This is a really simple app. It doesn't do anything real. This app is completely here to just demonstrate design time data. And here, let's start with this, uh, this label control. Um, so this label control here uh, has, has content, right? So that's easy, right? We, we can show content. But let's say you know, that you don't want the app to start with content in it. So we've added this new D colon. And D colon is there for every single property. 
Um, so if you type D colon, you're going to see every property that was normally available. Let's try that from the beginning. So I'm going to get rid of the content. Uh, just to warm up there. OK, so let's say I was typing content, right? IntelliSense would say, hey, yep, there's a property called content. Great. If I type D colon and I start typing content, once again, content would be available. So every property that's normally available in the control is available here. And once I uh, set that property to something, let's say Dimitri, the designer will show it. But when you run the app, we strip out all the D colon properties. So this property here, this fake text property here on the text block, et cetera, all of these would be stripped out. That means that as you're, as you're building and visualizing your application with D colon, you, you know that your run, running application is safe, and you're able to very easily set the real values. Like in the real world, this text box might be coming from a binding path, right? Like you can do that without worrying that something will be compromised when you, when you hit a 5 your app is running. But in the designer, you're no longer looking at a blank page or in the other extreme having to create a view model that is fake and having to populate all the properties and making sure that all the bindings are there. Um, it also kind of avoids the limitation that if you had a control that, that wasn't you know, like wasn't bound to a view model, let's say it was set by code behind or something, um, then you were kind of stuck. That was hard to create design temp data for. This makes it super easy. It does increase the amount of XAML you have a little bit, but it gives you a feature for it. So definitely a powerful thing. And uh, I'm just going to go ahead and just demonstrate the kind of things that I'm able to visualize, just, just to give you an example. So I've got things like, um, you know, like a, pa a password box. I'm able to see what a password looks like. So I can check the character. I can even change the character that I'm using to see if one character would look better versus another character. I'm able to do more complex rich box setup. So I'm able to not just decolon in a property, but decol in or, you know, rich text box that document and decol in flow document and paragraphs. So I'm able to mock all those up here to make it look exactly like I would expect it to look like. And this works for lists. It works for a data grid. So here's a data grid where I'm, you know, mocking up all the data. Here, the real data grid ha has bindings, but then I'm setting the item source to a very much a fake X array uh, using a D colon data grid item source. And again, all of this gets stripped out in runtime. So none of this makes it into your running application. And this will work for everything from list boxes to buttons. You can you can see what a button looks like enabled, disabled, without you know checked without having to worry that that will leak into your your real app. Um, you can Set a fake image. The only um, the only kind of limitation is the image has to be part of your solution, so set somewhere in your project. So, but if you do have a like a test image, you can set the image. You can imagine this working with resources that are, that are naturally embedded in your solution, such as you know icons and etc. And you can test what different icons would look like or different different visualizations that are images in your projects. And uh, this even works with things like date controls, et cetera, so, uh, or like this progress bar. So this sample app will give you all those examples. Um, we got a, you know, even a, data, a status bar down here that's fake, faked in terms of like the data that is showing. So everything that you can do in XAML pretty much can be done with design time data. And I hope you give it a shot. The feature is there for you. It's, it's not hidden under any feature flags. If you have 16.7, it is considered GA, so it is, it is available for you as well. All right, so that's the feature wise, and uh, you know there's things happening for WinForms as well. So definitely, release notes are the place to go to, to catch up what's going on, and uh, we're we're constantly working on new features. Um, in fact, if you look at preview, if you look at preview two for um, for the most recent release, which is our 16.9 release. So if you go to the preview notes there, and then you you scroll through, lots of great features coming in. But uh, we're also working on XAML tooling, so we've got. You know, we're trying to improve settings and, and other things that are going on in the application. We're enabling. This is really, really awesome. Super, super requested thing from the community. Uh, Xamarin Forms UWP support uh, for XAML Hot Reload has been delivered as part of this preview. Um, this is one thing that's sometimes not clear to folks watching on the stream. Like I, I say, well, I work on you know on XAML tooling. Like XAML tooling exists for both desktop customers and Xamarin Forms customers. So whenever I'm doing anything for XAML. I'm thinking about all of the all type of customers, and therefore um, my my engineering teams that I work with, uh, so, some that are sort of in Xamarin and some are, that are in in the desktop tooling. We we contribute to each other. We help each other build the product in a holistic way. So when the XAML tooling does something, they don't exclude Xamarin, right? We we do it for everybody. Um, it's really truly really amazing for me as a PM to have so many engineers helping make sure all this gets put together. So I'm always as excited for Xamarin changes as desktop, and uh, I hope so you are as well. 
Um, the last thing that we're going to talk about today is uh, Olia, who normally hosts this community stand-up, but she's, uh, she's enjoying some well, well-deserved vacation. So Olia, I hope, hope you're out there having fun right now. Uh, but she wanted us to mention the blog post she did. This is on the .NET blog. And the .NET blog uh, is where we, we bring features from you know, things relevant to the community at times, not just you know, purely .NET framework updates and stuff like that. Uh, but this is WebView 2 updates. So WebView 2, if you're not familiar, it's a Chromium-based web control. Um, it is the replacement for the current WebView. So WebView, the current one, versus WebView 2, the new one. And because it's based on Chromium, it is so much more powerful, right? It's, it's the most up-to-date web control you can possibly get. It is literally like installing the new, uh, the new Edge, Edge web browser on your machine. And we've really tried to bring it to every single developer we can possibly bring this control to. Now, here's our train of thought. We know that applica desktop applications across the board, whether that they're WinForms, whether they're WPF, whether they're on Framework, whether they're, they're on .NET Core, it doesn't matter, right? You, you have web browsers. Somewhere, so, somewhere out there has a web browser, and we want to make sure that, uh, or C++ developers or WinUI developers in the future, right? You, like the dependencies will be there. So we're making sure this control is available truly globally to all the developers. And in this one, or it brings the perspective of like talking about the web view and um, helping people understand which NuGet packages to look at, some of the history that went into, into making this possible, um, the features, the platforms that we support. And as you can see, like this thing can run on lots of lots of Windows machines all the way down to like server 2012, when you know Windows 7. And then it works with basically every kind of combination of, of framework and language that you can think of. So that's all available. Please check out Web, WebView 2. Please keep the feedback coming. But that's a, an active project we're, we're investing in very strongly. All right. So with that, that's all we had for today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop sharing here. And uh, thank you all for coming. I, I don't uh, see any questions in the chat that I could answer, but uh, I'm available up on Twitter at lylan.com. Please follow me. Please send me questions. Uh, if you have any desktop questions, I'm always there to help. I really try to try to be uh, somebody in the community that is responsive and my DMs are open. So if you've got anything you want to say, please say it. And uh, thank you all so much for joining us. It's been really great to have you. And see you at the next month's uh, .NET Desktop Community Standup. Have a great day. Take care.